The next speaker um, is, um, is uh, the, what, uh, what clinical trials should we consider for treatment and prevention? This is a combination. My moderator, my co-moderator, uh, Melissa, uh, here to my side, is one of the speakers on this. And it's a combined talk with uh, Sharon Chen from Australia uh, and Marissa. And uh, so I don't know exactly how this will work, but hopefully uh, Sharon goes first, and she's done this uh, down under. And then Marissa takes over after that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Chen, and I'm an ID physician and clinical microbiologist in Sydney, Australia. We would like to thank MSG for inviting us to discuss this rather challenging topic of what clinical trial should we be considering for the treatment and prevention of invasive fungal disease. So on behalf of Marissa Michelli and myself, thank you everyone for uh, being present at this session. These are our affiliations. Here is Marissa and here is uh, myself. And these are our disclosures for uh, the, um, this particular symposium. Now this was a complex topic and Marissa and I had rather a few Zoom sessions to discuss what we would discuss because this is a different sort of talk. We thought we could present a general talk and provide you know, um, us with general motherhood statements or we could go into specifics. And then there's the perspective of the many stakeholders in antifungal drug trials. Firstly, the patient, the all important component of a drug trial. Then there are the physicians, the pathologists, the radiologists, pharma, and various levels of governance. So after much discussion, we decided that we would focus on the fungus itself. So what is missing in various genera of fungi in antifungal drug trials? The next thing to focus is on a host, whether we focus on hematology, oncology, or whether we wander away from these well-known at-risk groups. And Marissa will be discussing this. Marissa will also be discussing some general issues about drug trials, drug-drug interactions, and some philosophical perspectives about types of trials and endpoints. What we will not discuss is early diagnosis because there are other topics in the MSG meeting devoted to this, and also cryptococcus for the same reasons. So my job is to focus on the fungus. Firstly, aspergillus, where are the unmet needs? Well, we know that prophylaxis trials and treatment trials are well established for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in the classic high-risk hematology patients. Do we need to repeat some of these trials acknowledging there are now new EORTC, MSG, ERC mycological criteria, such as the Aspergillus PCR, sequencing and adjustments of GM cutoffs for clinical trials. And this was ably led by Donnelly and um, Pappas in re for reforming these mycological criteria. There are newer drugs now and risk groups outside heme onc patients, and Marissa will be discussing this, but there are also other sites of infection moving away from lung infection per se, cerebral infection, where the recommendations for treatment using antifungal agents are either A2 or B2, but there are no RCTs or no RCT data that we to rely on. And what about bone and joint infection and infection at sanctuary sites. So these are things to consider. There are also breakthrough infections and refractory disease as opposed to primary disease where most antifungal trials are focused on. And finally, azole resistant disease, perhaps not in all geographic regions, but selected ones. And what are the barriers to performing such trials? Just for an example, looking at cerebral and CNS aspergillosis, and these are 
uh, recommendations taken from the guidelines put forward by the IDSA, led by Tom Patterson in 2016. And we see that for CNS infection, all forms of it, systemic voriconazole therapy is recommended. There was one RCT comparing voriconazole with amphotericin B, but very, very few patients had cerebral infections. So most of these data or the recommendations are taken from the many open label studies they are. And that's why, although it's strongly recommended that one uses voriconazole, we cannot assign an RCT designation of one, and therefore the quality of evidence is labeled as two. Surgical resection of focal CNS lesions, even harder. And yes, we will all do it, particularly if there's poor response to medical therapy, but the strength of evidence is not quite there for the, in the same form as for systemic antifungal agents. There are many, many articles such as these ones I've listed, and um, the consensus recommendation is that it's moderately recommended with a quality of evidence of two. In children as well, CNS infection with aspergillosis is more common than adults. So in children, do we recommend routine CT or MRI? And it's difficult to make a recommendation because the data are not really present. Other aspects of invasive aspergillosis that we might consider, more oral treatments other than the azoles, new drug trials. So we all know about alorifem. How does that fit in into the basic algorithm of managing aspergillosis? Do we wait until the patient fails? And there are some other types of um, uh, parameters to consider, and Oliver Cornelly may have discussed this in his talk just prior to this. What is the best time to assess treatment response? Are we actually harnessing the best times? Would shortening the time to response assessment be useful? And what do we mean by response? Partial response or complete response? That's not, not so hard to fathom. What is stable disease? And what is failure for the different forms of invasive aspergillosis? I know that I've not provided any answers, but I hope that we will be able to collectively think about these questions and come up with a consensus about how we may move forward. Moving on to mucormycosis, currently amphotericin B, a lipid form, is recommended, and then one follows by step down in you know, isapiconazole or posiconazole. But do we need new trials or open label studies to address this question? It's all about amphotericin. Can we use something else? And what is the optimum timing of step down therapy? I, for one, have been guilty of uh, prolonging the amphotericin phase simply for fear of stepping down too early. Should we be doing trials outside hematology oncology? What about patients with diabetes mellitus? Should more energy be focused on this group of patients? And what about ROCM or rhino orbital um, cerebral mucormycosis as opposed to other forms of mucormycosis? What are the best scenarios for performing trials? Case controls and combination therapy. It seems to me like combination is typically used very late in the game. And is this really the correct thing to do? Candida infections. We are all focused on candidemia for a start. So point two, invasive candidiasis. We know lots and lots about candidemia. And in the new candidemia drug trials, typically eye, heart, and bone infection are exclusion criteria. But why? These are the scenarios that we need more information in. We have focused on candidate species, on drug-resistant species, such as C. auris, as would have been discussed during this meeting. But there are other species, Glabrata, Tropicalis in some regions, which are becoming more drug-resistant, and perhaps more attention needs to be devoted to these species. Urinary candida infections, we need alternatives beyond fluconazole and amphotericin B irrigation. It works, but it's painful and it would be good to have some other options. 
When do we investigate for dissemination to other sites? When do we perform the echo in all patients, in some patients? And what's the optimal timing? And similar um, uh, considerations for ophthalmic examination, difficult um, when numbers are not large. Preemptive therapy studies are probably needed as we have for invasive aspergillosis, but we will need to standardize diagnostic approach approaches to do these large-scale antifungal trials. My last slide, or second last slide, we come to the uncommon moles in yeast, endemic fungi. The likelihood of RCTs are small for uncommon pathogens, and we rely on open-label studies and salvage therapy trials. Timing of enrollment is problematic because patients often need to fail before being allowed to enroll if there is a better drug to offer. So we need to think about what are the purpose of these salvage therapy trials and how best to serve the patient population we are trying to help. Perhaps we should be thinking about adaptive trial design with all its pros and cons. The endemics, these are generally well positioned. However, the assessment of response to drugs may be problematic and the timing of response to drugs may be problematic because they are different from, say, invasive candidiasis or indeed invasive aspergillosis. So that comes to the end of my section. Over to Marissa, and I hope that we will have a robust discussion after this. Thank you very much. So um, I'm in charge of the second part of this talk, and my job is to discuss with you um, the host issues and uh, more general issues, including study population, study design. We'll touch a little bit on um, response criteria, uh, although this was already discussed as well. So we know the most clinical trials focus on hemong patients with acute leukemia or allogenic peripheral stem cell transplant recipients because they are at a high risk uh, for these infections. Um, these infections are relatively more frequent among them, particularly invasive aspergillosis. And uh, biomarkers are better studied in this population, and we also understand better the radiological presentations of this disease in these patients. Um, with the update, updated definitions uh, by the URCT MSG, uh, there has been a great improvement also in uh, patient eligibility uh, for clinical trials, and also the proven and probable cases of IFI has been better characterized. But there are still issues that are well not addressed. Um, for, for instance, the issue of um, what do we do with uh, possible IFI cases? Um, breakthrough uh, IFI is typically not included in um, clinical trials. There is not a great definition for those either. Um, the recent antifungal exposure also precludes patients from being included in, the, in clinical trials. And the um, inability to enroll other hosts at risk. Uh, for instance, we know that other patients at risk for IFI include diabetic patients, clinical, critically ill patients, burn trauma, surgical patients, patients on dialysis, cirrhotic patients, and also patients uh, with cystic fibrosis. And if we take the example of the cystic fibrosis patients, we can see why this is important. 28% of CF patients are typically, um, have typically a fungi in the sputum, and they are more likely to be colonized with a non-fumigatous aspergillus species with uh, Fusarium, Alternaria, and rare fungi like Scutosporium, Alimentospora. There is no good definition for a pulmonary IFI in these patients, and the proposed definition differs significantly for, from the um, IFI uh, criteria by the MSG ERCT. So, um, so that's a problem. And then um, we don't really have a, a good understanding of how the biomarkers perform in patients with CF. These are patients that are typically exposed to antifungals, and they are at higher risk for um, developing or being colonized with um, acyl-resistant fungi. Um, 
So then there is the issue of uh, PK variability in these patients, especially with a uh, voriconazole. So this is even more important because most of these CF patients are eventually going to be uh, um, bilateral lung transplant recipients where all these issues become even more relevant. There is also the, um, a more of a general topic now um, going into what a study population will include in um, the clinical trials. So we know that there is scarce um, pediatric data. There is actually a study that looked into the clinicaltrial.com, all the studies listed from 2007 through 2017. And they show that actually uh, only 7% of all the clinical trials performed in that period of time were in PIDs. And 0.13% of all clinical trials were actually on antifungals. So that leaves us to a 0.009% of all clinical trials being on antifungals in pediatrics. And needless to say that uh, neonates were rarely included in those trials. So that is why it's not surprising that most recommendations in pediatric guidelines are basically uh, based on adult uh, RTC data. So the issue of um, equity and global representation in clinical trials has also been brought up there is a systemic review of 39 uh, clinical trials done in HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis between 1990 through 2019. And they found that um, highly affected countries are typically underrepresented, that um, they also, um, uh, patients with severe and relapsed cryptococcal meningitis are underrepresented on those trials. And there is also poor representation of women and local researchers' authorship on those trials. So there has been also um, a shift in the location of the trials over time based on incidents. And that actually brings an in inevitable questions, including the applicability of these findings uh, from uh, studies in patients with HIV to other uh, populations at risk for cryptococcal meningitis, for example, and the applicability of those findings to other geographic and socioeconomic settings. Well, um, Dr. Cornelly already discussed the issues with um, uh, the uh, current uh, definitions of response that we use in clinical trials, and we will still wonder, right, uh, that uh, are those um, uh, criteria accurate enough, and are uh, composite endpoints appropriate? How do we use those biomarkers actually as surrogate endpoints? And um, is it survival of, at all the best endpoint, or is it even a fair endpoint in, to be used in clinical trials? And most of us have seen patients that we have to say they are failures because they are actually loss of follow-up. Is that equal? So those are questions that are, um, you know, um, we wonder when we saw the current response definitions. So um, going into study design a little bit more, um, the non-inferiority design is broadly used um, in mycology and it works, right? But what do we do with those studies that showed actually failed to show um, the non-inferiority, right? I mean, what comes to mind is the active trial and where the primary endpoint was um, a fail, right? But all the secondary endpoints uh, were comparable between the two groups. So one wonders uh, what really clinically means to us when we are treating the patients, right? What is the clinical impact of these this, uh, trial results? And what it really means for the doctors treating the patients? So we already discussed about the, um, one of the issues with the open label studies, uh, the salvage studies, that most of them required the patient to fail before starting a drug that we know that they, it probably works. So the question is, well, 
bearing in mind the premise that we all know that early treatment improves survival, uh, are we wasting opportunity by having the patient fail before we start in a drug that we probably uh, know that is going to be working better than the one that does not work? So, and then in the era where most patients are on some uh, sort of antifungal prophylaxis, is it reasonable to have exclusion criteria based on recent antifungal exposure? And finally, when we have a patient with um, proven um, IFI, do a host criteria matter? I mean, do we need to meet that host criteria to be entered in the clinical trial? So after so many um, debate and discussion with Sharon, um, we came back to the question of what clinical trials should we consider for the treatment and prevention of IFI. And we came to the following conclusion that we actually need to focus uh, on, I mean, clinical trials that actually focus on the unmet needs including uh, broadened eligibility criteria to include populations at risk and sanitary sites, and fungal pathogens typically not included. We need less stringent salvage studies, and we also need studies that focus on patient groups' needs. Um, so, and we also think that the MS MSG ERG has a role on this, and our role is to continue to update definitions based on uh, current data, particularly on host inclusion criteria and biomarkers. We also think that we have a role on updating those response definition criteria to reflect a more realistic and tangible endpoints based on fungal diseases, pathogens, and host. And also, it's very important that we continue to promote discussions like these ones to promote change. Thank you.